Welcome to the Science Podcast for February 9th, 2018. I'm Sarah Crespi. In this week's show, David Grimm discusses lab animal happiness. What if standardizing lab animals' environment has made them less useful for science? Should we enrich the lives of zebrafish, rats, rabbits, mice, so that they're more like people? And John Abbott is here to talk about indoor chemistry. Even though some of us spend 90% of our time indoors, it turns out we don't understand much about the chemistry of the environment inside buildings. Now we have David Grimm, editor for our daily news site. He's here to talk about his recent feature story on lab animal happiness. Hi, Dave. Hey, sir. Okay, your feature asks questions like, should we make lab animals happy? How can we tell if they're happy and what happens if they are happy? Let's let's talk about first why they might not be so happy right now. Well, happiness is a very subjective term, but what animal facility managers and labs have focused on in the past is welfare. Are these guys healthy? Do they seem healthy? And are they free of disease. Now, that is obviously not the same as happiness. But the reason advocates are starting to say that maybe they're not happy is because of the environments we put them in. If you walk into any university and you look at a standard mouse cage, you're going to see a shoebox size cage, probably made out of clear plexiglass. It's probably got some corn cob, like a little bedding material mm-hmm. on the bottom. It's got a pile of food and it's got a spigot for water. And that's pretty much it. Same thing for fish. If you go into a fish lab, you'd see these tanks full of water with a bunch of fish swimming around, maybe some food in them, and that is it. So for decades, we've been keeping lab animals, especially rodents and fish, in these very kind of bland, very sterile environments. And for good reason. I mean, the idea is that it's the same in my lab as it is in your lab. Right. So the idea is it's very good for reproducibility because if a lab is trying to repeat its own results or trying to repeat the results of another lab, it wants things to be exactly the same. Also, scientists like to limit variables. They don't like a lot of other stuff interfering with their experiments. And they say, well, like if I put a running wheel in there, if I put toys in there, that's going to interfere with my experiment. And I need these guys to essentially be furry test tubes. They need to be exactly the same from cage to cage, from lab to lab. That sounds reasonable, but it turns out that this penchant for reproducibility, for kind of keeping variability out of the lives of these animals, might actually make them not such good test subjects. Well, there's two big problems in biomedical research right now. One is called the reproducibility crisis, and that is a lot of labs are having trouble reproducing other labs' results. And the other crisis is the translatability crisis. Only one in nine drugs that work in animals ever succeed in people. And advocates for improving the lives of lab animals are starting to say, well, maybe it's the way we treat them. We don't treat these animals anything like people. If you had a person and you put this person in a plain white room with no furniture, nothing to do, nothing to play with, nothing to entertain themselves all day long, and they sat there for years, and then you did experiments on them, would the results of those experiments have anything to do with us, with us as people that live our lives? We have challenges, we have stress, we have things to play with and entertain us and emotionally and cognitively Mm -hmm. stimulate us. And so what they're saying is that the same for animals, because if you've got a mice that lives in one of these barren cages, it's not anything like a mouse that lives in the wild, that's digging, that's burrowing, that's got friends to play with, right. that's got challenges every day. And how is that showing up in their biology? I can imagine that maybe the mice are crazy, <laughs> but are they also not as healthy because of this? Well, so, you know, lab rodents tend to be obese, they have weak immune systems, and they are more prone to develop cancer. And this is before we do any experiments on them. How can we tell that it's the way they're being treated, the way they're being housed, that is causing these problems? What kind of experiments are being done, or how do we know there's a connection there? Well, we don't know that for sure, but we know that things like stress, anxiety, can have an impact on immune systems. If you've got an animal that you're testing psychiatric drugs on and that animal is really depressed because it sort of lives by itself all day, Mm -hmm. um, then those drugs may be less likely to work. Or maybe they work really well in the animal, but they don't really work well in us because we're not at the same baseline as this animal is. So we don't know for sure that these environments are causing these problems. We know that things like stress, isolation, depression, not just in animals, but also in people, can have significant impacts on biology and physiology. We're not just talking about mice here or rodents. We're talking about fish and rabbits, right? We're talking about fish and rabbits. The one animal that I don't really talk about a lot in my story is non-human primates. And 
because these animals actually do live in a fairly, what we call enriched environment. They live thanks to changes in guidelines, both in the U.S. and abroad. They live in uh, environments where they have a lot of companions often, that they get toys, they get nesting material. Chimpanzees get movies and music, which I didn't realize. But again, when we're talking about rodents and fish, they don't get that much stuff. And so the story is really about, you know, should we be enriching the lives of these animals? Should we be giving rats soil to dig in like they have in the wild? Should we be giving mice running wheels? Because we know experiments have shown that they actually like running on wheels. They'll just sort of run on wheels for the heck of it. Should we be giving rabbits um, paper bags full of crinkly paper so they can tear it apart and kind of forge through it like they would forge in the wild? And there's a group at the University of Michigan, there's a team called the Real Program that is actually testing a lot of these enrichments in fish like multicolored marbles? Do fish like marbles in their tank? Does it remind them of maybe a, the bottom of a lake or a stream? What kind of results would they expect to see if these enrichments were working? So the first thing to see is, do the animals actually like the enrichment? So for the fish, you know, they give the fish the choice between kind of an empty side of their tank and a tank made with a plastic plant in it. And where do the fish spend more time? With rabbits, they know rabbits don't like certain enrichments because rabbits will pee on certain enrichments okay. if they add them. But, you know, say they add plastic keys for the rabbits to chew on, if the rabbits spend a lot of time chewing on the keys, and if they're much more likely to sort of have a companion in their cage and not fight with their companion, but actually get along with that companion if they have these plastic keys to chew, maybe this is an enrichment that works. So that's the first step. What enrichments actually do the animals like? Do they like having in their cage? And the second step is to see, do these enrichments actually improve science? Could they help address the reproducibility and the translatability crises. That are and going is that on. someone anyone has tried to answer so, so far? So that's what they're doing. You know, that's one of the steps now is to figure out, you know, do these things actually make a difference for the science? There is some evidence that this stuff makes a difference. For example, there was an experiment done in 2000 with mice that showed that mice that were given toys to play with and mazes to run through were much less likely to develop symptoms of a Huntington's-like disease than mice that lived in very barren standard caging. And in 2010, researchers showed a very similar thing with cancer in mice, that mice that had uh, played in an environment that had so many running wheels and you know wood blocks and mazes and stuff like that. One of the researchers' daughters actually calls it Disneyland for mice. That mice that were actually live in this environment were 80% less likely to get certain types of cancers than mice that live in standard caging. So we know enrichment can make a big difference for the physiology of these animals. And the question is, does it make a big difference for scientific research as a whole? What about the pushback that there's bound to be on this? I mean, how can you standardize something that's basically introducing fun into the lives of animals? Well, right. And now we get back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Is this going to not help but actually exacerbate the reproducibility crisis because, you know, if I'm using plastic red balls with my mice in my lab and you're using running wheels in your lab, how are we going to sort of reconcile our two experiments? And also these enrichments are very resource intensive. They can cost a lot of money. You're adding extra things to the cage, which have to be bought. They have to be cleaned. That can take a lot longer to clean cages. So, so some critics are pushing back and saying, can labs actually afford to do this? We've done a lot of stories on the podcast about how lab animals, they're affected by the gender of the person handling them. Introducing them to uh, wild strains of mice changes their microbiome and their immunity to different diseases. Is the lesson here really that variability is just going to help in the long run with experiments involving animals? And that's the big question. You know, I think what advocates would say is what we're really learning is that these animals are not furry test tubes and you can't treat them like inanimate objects. You've got to realize they're going to respond in interesting and complex ways to the environment around them. And we really need to start thinking a lot more about the environment that these animals live in. Okay. Well, what else is on the site this week? Do we have any non-animal stories, Dave? Okay. Well, Sarah, we've got a story about the science of silky, healthy hair. <laughs> Some news you can use. Also a story about an alien solar system that may have seven Earth-sized planets, at least one of which might have water on it. For Science Insider, our policy blog, we've got a story about new environmental laws in Canada. Also a story about a fight over a $1 billion tobacco research fund. So be sure to check out all these stories on the site. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, sir. David Grimm is the editor for our online daily news site. Stay tuned for John Abbott. He's up next with insights into chemistry that goes on inside of buildings. 
This Week in Science, John Abbott and Sasha Gligorowski write about the indoor chemical cocktail. And John is here to tell us what we know about pollution and chemistry inside of buildings and what we don't. Welcome, John. Hello. Uh, thanks for the invitation. What do you mean by indoor pollution uh, in the title of your article? The topic of indoor air has been has been looked at for a while. Topics that have come up a lot have been related to molecules that get emitted from uh, building materials or from uh, from the ground. For example, radon comes into basements. Yeah. Of late, in the last you know few years, uh, it's become apparent that there are a lot of reactive transformations, sort of real chemistry happening indoors. And so in addition to these sort of uh, potentially toxic sort of background materials that come from building materials, et cetera, there is also this transformation chemistry going on that, um, that we understand a lot about in the outdoor environment, but we haven't been paying as much attention to in the indoor environment. You name a few kind of known culprits in your story, um, things like bleach, cigarettes, cooking stoves, what what do we know that they're doing in, in, in the indoor environment and, and what kind of reactions are those materials that they emit undergoing? Yeah, some of the chemistry can be quite complex. Some can be quite simple. So in the case of bleach, we all know that it's not good to breathe bleach or when you're, when you're washing surfaces with bleach, the warnings are appropriate to say it, it's not good to, to do this in a poorly ventilated space. But I don't think people had looked at the detailed processes that occur. And as an example, it was found that um, if you wash a floor, for example, with bleach, most of the chlorine that's in that bleach comes into the gas phase in the form of different molecules, things called uh, hypochlorous acid and chlorine gas. And then those chemicals can go on and do further chemistry. And so I think those details were not so well understood. And the same goes true with cigarette smoke. We know we're not supposed to breathe it, uh, that it can be harmful. But uh, some of the detailed chemistry that it undergoes under indoor environments has not been studied previously. What about things that, you know, we hadn't thought were contributing to the chemistry of the environment, the air in particular in the indoors? What are some of the things that we should be looking at? My background is more in the outdoor chemistry world, but in the last few years, I've, I've been doing quite a bit of work indoors. One, one of the surprises to me was the role, for example, that humans play, human occupancy plays in setting the, the chemical state of, of the indoor environment. And, and so uh, an oxidizing species, an oxidant, that's commonly studied indoors is ozone, and it comes in mm-hmm. largely from outdoors. And so you, you can have certain amounts of ozone in an indoor space. The amount that you have will be dependent on how open your windows are and how leaky your house is. If you then have that amount of ozone and then you put people into that space, it turns out that the ozone is removed to some degree. And what's happening is that the ozone is actually reacting on us, reacting with our surfaces and producing chemicals we really hadn't anticipated would be in indoor spaces. Breathing ozone isn't great for you. At ground level, it's not the best thing. It's an emission from cars. But what about inside our house? Is that something we have to be concerned about? Or are we just observing its interaction with people at this point? Some of this chemistry is not necessarily bad. I'm entirely speculating here. I have no idea, <laughs> nothing to back this up. But you know, it may be that our skin oils have chemicals in them that do react with ozone in order to protect us against ozone. And, mm-hmm. and so you know, that chemistry going on may be uh, something that might actually be a good thing. It can uh, uh, produce molecules that are potentially allergenic. And so you know, some people may respond differently to that chemistry than other people do. One thing you point about out of is how fast these reactions are. Can you give us a sense of the time scale for that? Yeah, so there's some really classic work that was done by a couple of researchers, Vestaler and, and Weschler, who uh, illustrated that if you put two people into, this was a test chamber, but rather like an indoor room, the ozone would drop by a factor of a half on time scales of minutes to tens of minutes. And yeah. so the chemistry can be really very fast. Another example is... Um, what we emit even without chemistry occurring. For example, in, in crowded spaces like classrooms, uh, some personal care products have been observed to be the, the highest abundance chemicals in the gas phase. So if you can smell them, there's chemistry probably going on, right? That's exactly the point. You know, we're, we're, we're bringing um, really advanced new instrumentation indoors in the last few years. And we're learning, you know, what is indoors. And so it's a little bit of an exploratory phase right now. Right. One interesting thing you mentioned is lighting. So 
light inside tends not to have a lot of UV raining down on us, but outside the sun emits in the UV range and it affects the chemistry in the air. What are some of the differences between indoor and outdoor chemistry because of that change in lighting? I hadn't appreciated this until I started working in this area is how dark it is indoors. It can be, you know, a hundred times, maybe even a thousand times darker inside in than it might be outdoors on a sunny day. And on top of that, the ultraviolet light can be attenuated even more so. You know, indoors, it's a little bit like uh, twilight. <laughs> the chemistry that will proceed will be that which doesn't need as energetic uh, sunlight. Uh, you know, the photons don't have to have as much energy in them. You kind of describe this cleaning process of the air when it comes to sunlight and how that might be something going on inside, but with a totally different mechanism. The outdoor environment is known to be oxidizing, meaning that um, some of the chemicals that we emit or plants emit into the atmosphere get degraded through this oxidation process. That will go on more slowly indoors because we don't have as much ultraviolet light, as, as you said. But it will still proceed, and we're trying to find out whether it proceeds via the same pathways, but more slowly, or via perhaps different pathways. One area that I'm interested in is the chemistry that proceeds on surfaces indoors. Some surfaces we, we wash very frequently, like kitchen countertops, but others, walls and windows, we yeah. may not wash as frequently at all. Are those surfaces still pristine, or have they built up this sort of organic-like layer on them, having been exposed to molecules for months or years. And then upon exposure to ozone or to these low levels of light, what happens to them? Should we think about this as pollution? Does there have to be a, a degree of danger to call something pollution? Or is it we're making things dirty by living in them? And these are the things that we need to think about because we're inside so much. Yeah, I, I'm hesitant necessarily calling the whole field a pollution field because yeah. uh, much of the chemistry is what we're accustomed to and we have been accustomed to for a long time. It is certainly the case that in many circumstances it can be more polluted outside than inside. But indoors you can have a different types of compounds, you can have different types of organics that build up that might have different eventually potentially toxic effects. A very dramatic example of this for which there are very serious health concerns is cooking indoors. In particular in the developing world, there can be a lot of very inefficient or use of very inefficient cook stoves with very poor ventilation. And that will release harmful chemicals into the air, things like soot and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are known to be can be quite toxic. And uh, those can be in the air, but then they can also deposit onto surfaces. I think it's very clear that that's a form of pollution that has to be yeah. addressed. Yes. And what about pollution from the outside coming into the house or a building? I mean, is that something that will be detected in this kind of research? Yes, that's always an important reference state is to look at what is outside because we know what's outside is always coming inside to some degree. And so ozone, again, is a good example. It, it comes in from outdoors. Uh, nitrogen oxides uh, sometimes come in from outdoors. Particles as well. And it all very much depends on how leaky your house is or your building site is. You know, there's a tendency to now to um, close our windows, to air condition, uh, to make the house houses quite tight, uh, right. to uh, make them more energy efficient. There's a compromise there because you're, you, it's true, you're restricting outdoor pollution from coming in, but you're also then accentuating these indoor sources. Mm -hmm. So should we leave our doors open or doors or windows open or our windows closed? I mean, that's a hard one, too. It sounds like the jury's still out. I think the jury <laughs> is still out. The intention here isn't to say there's chemicals, there's chemicals in your house, chemicals are bad. It's more about a better understanding of what's going on inside and outside and how we can kind of balance our control of, of things that might be bad for us. Is that right? That's exactly right. We just need to understand fundamentally the chemistry that's occurring indoors. As a chemist, I find it a very intriguing space in which to work. And, uh, and there's a lot unknown here. And we can learn a lot by uh, combining the expertise that uh, building engineers and indoor air quality scientists have developed over many years of working in this field with some of the chemical insights that have been learned in the outdoor environment in the last uh, few years as well. I interviewed someone a very long time ago about microbes in the built environment and how sampling them has this new enterprise that has really revealed a completely different way of thinking about where we live. You know, there were 
specific microbes that live on electronics that were being found. <laughs> and this really seems to follow along those same lines. We've built something. Now we actually need to use some science to understand what, what we've done. You know, the lessons from some of the microbiological work indoors are that, you know, humans have a large impact. And, and I think that uh, human occupancy is also being shown to have a you know, very high impact indoors, not only through our activities like cooking and cleaning, but also just from, from being ourselves indoors. Yeah. All right, John, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate the chance to talk about this topic. John Abbott and Sasha Gligorowski write about the indoor chemical cocktail this week in science. You can find a link to their article at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and many other places. Or listen to us on the science site at sciencemag.org slash podcast, where you can also find links to the research and news stories discussed in each episode. The show was produced by Sarah Crespi. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.